Um, so this will be my second lecture now. We had uh, yesterday morning the first one. Maybe I should, I will just, um, no, it doesn't work again. This will be recorded and then, and then not, let's see. Okay, now it's good. So a brief um, summary, uh, maybe also of yesterday because not everybody has been here. And so I have been, I mean, I will talk about um, the semi-classical foundations of many body quantum chaos. Um, we started with a more overlook uh, of the whole field of quantum chaos, say the pillars. And then I considered in the first lecture, mainly uh, the usual semi-classical limit we speak of. This is H bar going to zero which means um, H bar is a Planck's quantum small compared to classical actions in the system involved. Usually the actions get large if you go to high energies. Then I uh, summarized a semi-classic quantization of single particle dynamics, both the integrable, integrable case and also the outer case where good Swedish trace formula then shows up. And I've done this because we need this as kind of platform also for day, today because the idea is to lift all this to the say level of second quantization. And then I discussed only briefly the, the mean density of states. So then I went indeed for, for from single to a few or many particles for the so-called wild term, the average density of states. There was not much time. There was no time to this outlook of and particle scattering. If anybody is interested in that, we can also discuss this in a smaller group during the afternoons. Okay, today, um, so I will talk about um, indeed a complementary limit that Andre already mentioned yesterday and introduced in the context of the Hubbard model. And I'm rather grateful to him because you introduced the model already or the um, important aspects there. And I will refer to this again. So this is an, uh, a limit where you can define an effective H bar, which is just one over particle number. So for large particle number in a many body system, this will get important. And then I explain a bit what this means. Then we come to the question, can we generalize the Gutzwiller van Fleck propagator, indeed in this complementary context. And then I will have two applications about what one could call many body echoes. One involves the Gutzwiller van Fleck, the other um, coherent states, which I will explain then briefly in coming to that point. Um, and again, if time is left over, <laughs> let's see, then we will have a brief outlook about how to whether one can also control many body quantum chaos. You know, Sometimes chaos is considered as an enemy. Everything is chaotic and unstable and so, but why not um, trying to, well, get it, make advantage out of chaos? And we will see what aspects there are the ideas we are following at the moment. Okay, just as a quick reminder, this is the transparency from yesterday. So one key thing was that um, I showed what is the Gutzwiller van Fleck semi-classical propagator. It's approximation to the single particle quantum propagator from an initial to final here in configuration space. This is one possible uh, representation. And the main aspect is that you have a sum over classical paths with classical entries D and actions R defined here, the usual Hamiltonian action. However, this is augmented by H bar. So quantum physics and interference enters through these phases and of course through H bar that is here and here and here. So it is a hybrid classical quantum that's why it's semi-classical. But important is one has to include interference between different classical parts. Um, then one step further. So this is kind of the building block to compute many things. We have the propagator, we can get the Green's function and then different response functions and so on. And um, as an example, I showed um, briefly again, the main steps towards the, what is known as the Gutzwiller's trace formula, namely to compute the density of states out of this um, semi-classic propagator. And then we get two terms. One is so-called wild term in the quantum chaos community. That is the average density of state, sometimes called also Thomas Fermi term. So what you get if you have a high temperature or you have an energy or disorder average, plus oscillations due to periodic orbits. That was the main aspect of Gutzwiller. And um, so here again, the semi-classic limit H bar to zero is taken. And moreover, Gutzwiller assumes that the classical side is indeed chaotic. That is, 
means in the best case, all periodic orbits that enter here into this trace formula are unstable. And the instability is kind of covered here, incorporated in these um, um, amplitudes. And you see this kind of a Fourier series. So the more orbits you take include, you know, the longer the orbits, the bigger the action and the stronger the energy dependence. And thereby you kind of, in the case, would approximate the quantum mechanical spectrum, though there are many issues concerning the convergence of this representation. Now we would like to get, get to the other direction. And for this, I also um, show one transparency from yesterday. Uh, so what I have plotted there is on the one hand, the number of particles from one to many, rather roughly. And the horizontal direction was here, this classical parameter, you know, this ratio between action S and H bar. This is the one that enters here, for instance. So if we start at low, small actions at low energies, we are in the regime of wave functions in the true quantum mechanical, say single particle regime here. And good stress formula mainly covers this part here, namely the link between waves in, in the deep quantum regime. And on the other side, the other extreme is the fully classical regime where indeed H bar is zero literally. And um, so good stress formula works here and um, kind of yeah, make the link towards more and more classical physics. Though, as I was saying, it's important this um, crossover is not um, uniform. So you have a singularity here because we have a simple system here, this billiard with um, nodal lines and the bright parts and blue are the amplitudes of the complicated wave function such a billiard. The bigger S over H bar, that is in other words, uh, smaller the de Broglie wavelength, the more strong oscillations you will have here. So the wave functions get ever and ever more oscillating if you approach this limit and suddenly everything is calm because suddenly you reach the classical regime. So this is of course a singular point creates a lot of interesting physics. And of course also difficult physics. Anyhow, so I mentioned yesterday only briefly and would like to discuss this now in more detail. Now you can consider um, as we will see in complementary limit, but there's a question. Yeah, please ask questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you straight to zero, is this is discontinuous? I mean, saying that everything is calm is of course a bit exaggerating. You know, this is that you have all the waves, and suddenly there is a flat sea. You're right. I mean, if including averages or broadening or smoothing, then of course you. Um, I mean, you can also smooth out this discontinuous limit here. You know. Yeah. I think it depends now really what type of average you're doing. I mean, later we will consider as an example, take a weak localization, for instance. Of course, there will be also, if you do there or green backscattering, you do disorder average there or energy average, still something purely quantum, um, of course, uh, remains there, even upon averaging. You know, there's, um, you cannot get a. It would not disappear. It disappears in the sense, I mean, with respect, again, it, for, I mean, now one has to ask what is then the, um, the system you consider, for big as a system, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's also what you meant. Yeah, so relatively the fluctuations get smaller. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. 
yes, I mean, yeah, but take also take the density of states, for instance. So you will, you know, the density of states here of, the, of this billiard will always show peaks. But classically, you won't have, and you will have smooth points. But it's, I think it's a good point that, of course, it depends on what type of observable and quantity you look at to see this crossover. Um, so, so now the other complementary um, direction is that you consider you can even be at small s over h. So you could be here. Now you lift things to quantum field theory, about say from a field operators and field quantization. And again, there's a, as Andre was mentioning already, and also in the morning, this was kind of implicitly mentioned. There again, kind of classical limits to that, the semi classical limits. And so the one limit is here of large particle number, where in the true, say, thermodynamic limit of n going to infinity, um, the quantum fields merge into nonlinear waves and wave equations. And this will, we will discuss with um, the example of the Bose Hubbard model in the detail later. And again, in between, there's now a regime of finite, but maybe large n, where then one over n is, can be considered as an, as an effective h bar. And the idea is to compute the leading order correction starting from here. As Goodswiller, also Van Fleck Goodswiller, compute the leading order semi correction coming from the classics. So there, just one should remember there are two different notions of classicality and semi-classical limits. You can also think of limits going like this here or others. Um, now, again, to make a, get an idea, what is the difference now between wave interference and indeed many body quantum interference? We go back to our, yesterday we had the double slit. Now we have a triple slit. So this, of course, are, you have three, three paths here that give finally here the wave function final picture. But now think of um, the optical lattice, the Bose Hubbard system later, which Andre introduced you. So you have now particles, say bosonic atoms here in such a periodic lattice. And again, you can, I mean, we will use now single particle states and occupation number in a four group state representation. I just introduced it here already. You have the vec n vector means now n1, the particle numbers here, occupation numbers in the different sites. And to take, for instance, such a situation, you start from one, three, zero, and you would like to compute now the final propagator, K of T, to a new final state, two, one, one. And this is one example where you have three paths now in Fox space. So here, here we have three paths giving rise to wave interference and the interference pattern. So each of these arrows, um, the, the composite thing defines one many particle path. And you see they are different now. There's, there's these arrows too. So this is just a, a, a qualitative idea. Picture how to see many particle paths. And um, now the issues of course, the differences is that the interference might be more complicated to compute because now you have not only each particle interfering with itself, but also with the others. We have true many body quantum interference later. You might include interactions. You have high dimensional um, spaces and we come back to that. Now, the idea is to um, kind of generalize um, this uh, the good filler from Fleck propagator to the many body bosonic dynamics. And what you see here is may, uh, nearly the same as Andre also um, showed yesterday. So the Bose Hubbard model describing, for instance, um, here and interacting bosons with short range interactions. I used B and for bosons, he used A, but instead of that, I think a factor of one half here, it's the same um, notation. One back capital L defines the number of sites here of your system. And NL is just here, the particle number of it. Um, now we would like to, in the next step, try to, I mean, on the one hand, you, one can solve this problem quantum mechanically to compute the many body propagator. And however, we would like to make the link to semi-classical physics. And um, as also Andre mentioned, uh, you should, one cannot just simply um, send n to infinity because then the interaction term would be dominating 
the rest and you would always get into a Hubbard type, I mean, into a mod type regime. So one should rescale this probably, and I also use G now, I think we use also G for this rescaled interaction. So taking the large N limit means also you should use at the same time. Um, Andre will, I mean, I say here it's a quantum coding system. This is a bit rough and should, it really depends now on the number of sites on J and U and N mainly. Um, yesterday we saw how to semi-classically quantize this system if you have just sites. Then it is integrable because we have energy and particle number con conserved. And this allows you then, as Andre was showing, to do again already a many body semi-classical quantization. A bit as or similar to the torus quantization I introduced yesterday morning. And now the idea is to um, consider, however, the systems which is non integrable. And this, um, I think, Andre, you will talk about that also about parameters. And so um, there's a recent PIL also by Andreas Buchleitner's group where they consider in detail the regimes, how the system, um, what is the classicality in the many different regimes of this system. Anyhow, so we, the idea is to start from a Fox state and um, to compute the propagator. Well, this is more, so the quantum mechanical version would start from an initial Fox state, the one with the, in this example, for instance, then you would use the full quantum mechanical many body propagator and um, compute uh, and project it into the final state. Now, what we know from Gutzwiller from single particles in configuration space is that, okay, there we kind of, um, in this, as I was discussing, the wave of equation for particles um, is the um, small h bar limit is then represented finally in terms of propagator of classical trajectories. And here it's similar, we have just lifted everything to second quantization. So we should start from fields, consider large N and use as a kind of a skeleton or backbone of our propagator now again, the cl corresponding classical object. And those are now these nonlinear wave equations or classical field equations. So in doing so, I mean, then this is because um, many people have considered this direction, many different fields. Um, in I one idea, of course, is since one is interested in semi-classical concepts to use a Korean state uh, representation because Korean states qualitatively would describe, I, you know, are kind of the mo most classical states. In harmonic oscillator, for instance, you would have a kind of a green state is moving back and forth, forth similar to a classical particle as a wave packet now. So this is tempting and has also, um, there are good reasons to do so. And I will come back to this at the end or in the middle of the um, um, lecture. However, here we would like to follow more Goodsvillers lines. This has various reasons because at the end with, with Korean states, you will have complex actions, which are in a way more difficult to treat if you do finally ergodic averaging in a certain way. I will again see more later. So we need to like to get to a kind of type or a representation. And this you can do by introducing so-called quadratures. So this is um, Q and P formally, they are formally analogous to um, single particle momenta and positions, though you shouldn't inter I mean, interpret them in the literal sense. They're called, I think, quadratures in the um, quantum optics community. And you see that there are just linear combinations of P and D uh, dagger, um, similar to the harmonic oscillator. And they fulfill the canonical rotation relation, so similar as the QP pair in the Smith particle. The idea is also to do this because we, at the end, we would like to have a Fox, I mean, a propagator and Fox state. But um, this means to get from the final propagator indeed to a kind of a semi-classical propagator, you need to slice your system into a continuous variable in order to compute. You no longer have then discrete quantum numbers in between semi -classical. And um, so to this end, we use this Q and or we can use Q and P. You, um, it's better, you uh, can appropriately rescale this. This is a minor part. Also, you might have seen it yesterday at the, at the blackboard in Andre's talk where he rescaled his A's and A daggers. And then you should proceed in principally, indeed, as um, um, for the single party case. So you, you see this looks formally similar. We have now 
the Rosa Hubbard propagator, still the final part on the go. Here n is now our one over effective h bar, and r is then once we do now the semi-classical saddle point or station phase approximations, you see the r is just given by the now the action corresponding to the mean field of classical equations. So related to the Hamiltonian H classical, sometimes I say also H mean field because this uh, synonyms leave, which is uh, you guess get if you just um, replace in your Bose Hubbard Hamiltonian now the um, operators by uh, C numbers. You can say very similar to what Andre did. So this is the, uh, I mean, Section. Now, at the end, however, we would like to have a propagator in Fox space. And so we need to um, kind of get back from this representation in QP space here in the quadrature representation to um, particle numbers. And you can do this by closer relation. You have to compute kind of um, projections here, projections. They turn out um, as um, Hermit polynomials that in the large n limit, where you get more and more classical indeed are related to canonical transformations between the QP variables and now our new action angle variables like so N is now the particle number and the corresponding contribute variable will be an angle because the whole thing should be um, yeah, as usual. Okay, so you have to do this technical step, but then you end up indeed with a propagator now semi-classically, no longer in terms of any full quantum final paths, but paths that are following now the classical dynamics of the classical mean field modes and equations. And this is summarized here. So we see again, I mean, it's, formally it looks similar to what we saw at the beginning, but we are now in Fox space. So we start from an initial quantum state like this distribution, one example. We would like to propagate to a new state NF with these type of occupations. And we have now many paths, but those paths are no longer paths of particles you know, because we are now, we talk about fields. So you should rather think of modes, collective modes of all particles that form then a path here. Now, what is, um, what does this path is now in the kind of the phase space version, the semi classical version of our L dimensional Fox space. So L was the number of sites. And the phase space dimension is then two times L. And now, in, in order to make link again to the um, classical symbol of the Milesian and um, creation operators, we reduce psi here. It's related to Q and pi, and but maybe be better to see here psi. Again, we saw it yesterday, it's the square root of NL occupation number of the L side here with the corresponding angle. So Psi is lived in one of this size. Now, the propagator should propagate from the initial to the final states. So it should, you have certain boundary conditions. So Psi squared then should match the quantum mechanical initial occupation number here at zero time and correspondingly at time capital T here again should match um, the corresponding um, um, quantum state. And again, the action, as I was discussing already, is now this Lagrangian. And now in the new coordinates, no longer P and Q, we have now theta and um, so the angle, that is the array of angles and the array of um, well, um, occupation numbers. Okay, so what does it psi means now? What does it fulfill? Um, I actually repeat everything what Andre was saying yesterday. So now we come to the classical side and there indeed, we, what we have is that the Bose Hubbard model on the quantum side uh, is now con um, merged into um, the, cl the classical Hamiltonian. You have to take the derivative. So you solve the Hamiltonian equations of motion and this looks like, and is in a way, is a, like a Schrodinger equation, which looks classical from the perspective of second quantization. But think of it just as an Hamiltonian equation. So dBt of psi is equal to h bar over h over psi. And then you see here just now these entries. Um, 
And you see this is a nonlinear equation because psi now depends here. Uh, you have a term which is um, cubic in psi. So you, we took the derivative of the quartic term we had in the Hamiltonian, that's why it's cubic. And this is why it is nonlinear then. So we get now, we have kind of the mean field limit and the mean field equations are nonlinear in this limit of large um, occupations. Okay, and you see it is discrete because we started from a discrete Hubbard model. So we have a discrete gross Kitayevsky equation. And in principle, what one would need to do is now solve, and we do this implicitly later in examples, you have to solve these mean field equations. I mean, for um, time dependent mean fields, which side. And now we see we have to compute all different solutions that are compatible with these boundary conditions to get all the paths. Suppose we have the paths, then we would need to compute the action and the amplitudes here. And then you can build up a semi classical um, approximation for the final property. Now, before I come to more details there, let me say a few words on um, what does this mean before computing? It's, of course, much easier. Suppose now your system is indeed, I mean, I mentioned we have a nonlinear classical system. Suppose it is indeed fully chaotic or mainly chaotic. Then we have now, um, of course, the open of exponents associated with unstable modes. So all those mod modes would be now unstable. And in this sense, also the term many body quantum chaos makes sense. Quantum chaos, what means chaos there? People would say, okay, you have many body systems strongly interacting, this is kind of complex and chaotic. But um, here, I think we have a notion of chaos in the many body context. We can, of course, we can argue chaos is rough, mainly a classical concept. Now it is the concept of instability of cla the classical mean field solutions. And then the question is, how does this instability enters indeed into the semi classical? Now it's full proper bridge. Yeah. It's a wave equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the sense that you have, I mean, that you, but that the, yeah, it's a nonlinear wave equation. It's, it's nonlinear. It's a nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And thereby the wave, the solutions are unstable or can be unstable. I mean, they need not. Often they are stable and so on. Might have fixed points that could be unstable, oh, or you have kind of um, paths. So, I mean, you can again um, formalize that. So, but uh, so the idea is you, I mean, again, you have always quantum classical on the single particle level, where classical nonlinear physics gives rise to quantum chaos or wave chaos better. And here, the same happens at that level. Conceptually, it's rather similar, one, but one should leave the idea well, that there are particles, there's just one particle moving. It's always a whole mode that is moving. Um, and then also this is related then to scrambling. We will talk a bit on, about that on first. Okay. Also, what, however, the other aspect is now we have here too many body interference because each single path I met is a kind of a mean field solution. You know, you solve the classic um, nonlinear mean field equations. So you have many different mean field solutions that come, well, that finally are coherently added up to create the whole many body quantum propagator. So this is indeed from this perspective, um, genuine many body quantum interference. Yeah, as um, Diego was saying, I mean, we have wave equations already. There is also interference in that level. This is a different type of interference between different mean field modes. Or you can also call it correlations. Um, it has to do also with entanglement. So this would be, for me, I can only give qualitative statements to kind of indeed quantify this. The idea is the following, that if you start with a single mean field mode, this is kind of a separable non-entangled mode. And then, however, they interfere, they entangle. I'll come back to this a bit also on Thursday. Anyhow, so in principle, so we have now a, an object to start with to compute different um, functions. Now, there's one further aspect important, and this refers here to what um, 
is related to Ehrenfest or scrambling time, and I will include this in, explain this in a second. Then the idea is now that, um, well, maybe I could just go to the um, transparency of the Ehrenfest time. However, um, I go back now to the single particle context because that's easier to explain the Ehrenfest time, I think. So we go back um, from our many particle um, for the Hubbard system to um, a billiard. There's a question here. Well, not, not completely because, I mean, you, the mean field limit or the mean field gets better and better the larger the particle number. This might, uh, it might be, yeah. So this case here we have a value for the Bose Hubbard, there's a well defined mean field regime. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the idea is, of course, in principle here, computing mean field solutions is easier than solving the whole problem. But it's, uh, um, but it's difficult enough. So. Anyhow, so, but what is the Ehrenfest or scrambling time? Probably many of you know this, but it's important. I think this is the most important time scale in quantum chaos because it links classical to quantum physics. And this is shown here for the simple billiard. So we, uh, we launch a wave packet, this blue spot here, the Gaussian wave packet to the right. The billiard is such that one knows it is chaotic. So if you, you would just, um, you see the wave packet, if it would just follow the classical path, it would look easy or something like that. However, we see the wave packet goes to the right, it's bouncing back, it starts to self-interfere. And after a few time steps, you see it, it starts to scramble. Now the Ehrenfest time, let's point this out, is now separates the regime between the time scale, the shorter time scale, where you can describe the wave packet dynamics through a guiding trajectory to one classical trajectory and its neighborhood, compared to the regime where you have really interference, wave interference, and no longer one path is enough. And this you can estimate. You cannot say, okay, I have my quantum state here. It has a certain width. Um, and I, um, that is here given by the de Broglie wavelength here in the space. And now I, on the other hand, think of a classical swarm of particles that starts there. Then if the system is chaotic, then there, of course, the, the whole initial blob will increase exponentially given by the Lyapunov exponent of the billiard times the time. And the Ehrenfest or scrambling time is the time scale until this uh, is um, the lambda d is um, increasing up to the system size L. So roughly say up to t equals four here. So you see the whole wave function fills the whole space. So this, you see what Ehrenfest time is rather, it's a um, rough concept, but um, now you can, of course, resolve for t e, and you see it is, depends now on, on one over the Lyapunov exponent on a purely classical quantity, times the log of um, L over lambda db. Well, this is again our semi-classical parameter, S over H bar. So here we see there H bar enters and here chaoticity and Ehrenfest time includes both. Now, another thing important to, to remember is it logarithmically depends on S over H bar. So it's a rather short time scale, usually. Now we get back to, um, again, I should mention, I mean, I should give credit to many people in quantum chaos and um, mesoscopic physics during the 90s. This was a huge field there until the, from 1990 roughly, or 95 to 2010 or so, where air and fast time effects in mesoscopic quantum physics have been considered a lot, mainly in the single particle regime. Now we get back to our point, point here it's the same. We are now, however, just one level higher. The lambda here is no longer the single particle Lyapunov exponent, but it is the Lyapunov exponent describing the instability of my mean field modes. And we know H effective is now, or S over H is now our N. And you see, if we put here, say a macroscopic system, N is 10 to the 23, but the log is then just order 30, 40 um, times the inverse Lyapunov exponent, extremely short time scale then, even for a macroscopic system. So the point I would like to make at the end is at this, as we saw here, 
after the Ehrenfest time scale, we have wave interference. The same happens here now. Oops. After the Ehrenfest time scale, indeed the mean field paths, mean field paths interfere. And we, that is the time scale where genuine many body quantum interference sets in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that it depends on what uh, it has. It depends then on the system. I think I would not know about a general definition. Of, of course, they separate linearly, so you have also you wouldn't have the logarithmic dependence then. Yeah. It's typically algebraic, but it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, algebraic in general, and then depends on the system also. Also, the, if, if, if toroi, of course, you have still ergodic dynamics on toros. So, so if you're spreading on the toros, they, well, the system is integrated. But thank you for asking. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. Um, we, I will discuss this a bit on Thursday. Um, I mean, I think one is, a, I don't know, I, I don't have a short answer to that. It depends on whether you consider then systems with a semi-classic or classical limit as those ones or other quantum chaotic many body systems like spin chains, for instance. The in Ehrenfest time in the very sense doesn't exist because you don't have any, you don't have a notion of a Lyapunov exponent on this classical side. And again, there you might have still um, um, also a certain growth that depends, however, then on the system. So I think it is everything there is possible. One should be extremely careful when considering growth of, um, you know, of OTOCs or um, what is behind that. Because also then again, one has to distinguish between different time scales. Even this is rather rough. We have a rather short time scale, which is just the inverse Lyapunov exponent, the time scale to scatter first and so, where you don't have an exponential increase um, in OTOC or corresponding quality. But we can get back to that on maybe on Thursday. So, um, Okay, the idea is now, I mean, this is now the, you know, the, um, we have the overall propagator. And now we could argue, okay, let's do take a trace again and compute the density of states of the many body system. So can we kind of lift uh, good spheres uh, to say quantum fields? And this is of course in principle possible now, and we can do it because you, it is, formally it looks like good uh, derivation, though it is more involved. You need to keep still, of course, the um, semi-classical limit. You should assume chaotic mean field dynamics. You should take the trace now in um, Hilbert space or Fox space. And then you find indeed a trace formula here, which looks like the Goodswilla trace formula. However, you have to interpret it differently. So the many body density of states now, is has again an, a mean part. And a part, I should have not written periodic orbits, but rather periodic mean field modes. So those are now, you know, we had our modes here. They are now closed and periodic, but still mean field modes. Oops. And then you see they enter as a classical action over H bar effective as in the cosine form, very similar to Gutsula, but everything now in this Fox space. Um, now, that means many body interference here for the density of states shows up as an interference between mean field solutions. Interestingly, um, this holds also for ground states because there, now the semi-classical limit is no longer the semi-classical limit of small h bar. 
you know, in this horizontal direction I had, but the limit is large particle numbers. So even if you have a ground state of a large particle number system, this should work because we are in the right limit. And finally, um, however, one should admit, of course, to compute as many body spectrum is rather difficult from such a formula because you need to find in a high dimensional phase space, these periodic mean field modes, compute the stabilities and all that. I'll show an example for different quantity later that this is possible. Here, I think it, it is more conceptually important. And that is, um, I will discuss in lecture three, the link between semi-classical chaos and quantum semi-classical physics on the one hand in the chaotic system and random matrix theory is um, provided through um, co subtle correlations between periodic orbits. And this has been, I mean, established for the single particle context using Butzwiller. And I will show this then again. However, knowing that there's a corresponding formula also here in the many body context, we can adopt all these um, methods there indeed to explain why RMT also should work. I mean, from this perspective, it's unreasonable as we know in the many body system. Anyhow, I will now give, and I should check a bit the time, um, two um, examples to see whether this indeed works. And this is just now you know, an approximation. And so we go back to our propagator. And now uh, on Thursday, I will talk um, about OTOCs, how to use this there. The bosonic assumption is in the commutator relations between the, um, these, the, this bosonic commutator relations. And in a sense that, pardon me, and, um, we can, we could do the same, but this is on a shaky ground because we have now there not, I mean, if, say take the spin one half, there's no semi-classical limit. So this is a whole open field. I, I mean, this is a field with long history, how to do semi-classical physics for spin one half particles. I mean, to, we can really discuss, I would like to discuss it more, more. My answer here, my short answer is, we can write down a propagator like this, or we have done also this and published, which is um, not unique, but still, if you compute later expectation values and average, then you get um, ex uh, the semi-classical results are extremely precise, way more precise than we would have expected. I think it has to do with averaging, but we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, this is related to that, yeah. Yeah, it depends. I mean, you take Harty Fock, for instance. I mean, Harty Fock is a mean um, atoms. You have also electrons there. But, but it is, I mean, it is related to that, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, so what I will discuss here is two things two types of echoes, query and backscattering. So we would like to generalize weak localization to a Fock space now. Um, and then, which is more, way more complicated, a full evaluation of an autocorrelation function later without um, averaging on top. So let's, we are, let's talk about, I mean, now with Korean backscattering, you can think it is rather analogous to what one knows from weak localization or Korean backscattering from optics or electrons. Now, however, in a different space. So what you need to compute are, well, the quantum transition probability between initial and final Fox states we plug in our semi-classical propagator and get a double sum. And here we do the simplest approximation. You would also do in a disordered system, for instance, if you do diagrammatic motivation theory, we just pair equal paths with gamma equal to gamma prime, what is known as diagonal approximation. And then of course, uh, here the action and thereby the phases cancel and you are just left with a purely classical object, just the square, the absolute square of A gamma which are classical quantities. And this is then a classical probability to get from an initial to a final state. And this is an example, just we have here Rosa Hubbard with five sites with um, two, four, six particles. So either you go say from here to a new state, which would the, the initial and the final state is different. Then you would do, a, I mean, then it's the usual approximation. The, you have just one classical part. However, if you, now to a state back to the same state here, you see it, those are the same. Then as you know, we have two paths, either one goes in this direction or vice versa, the time reverse path. 
I mean, it's the physics in principle, the idea is as in weak localization or print exterior. However, this is now in the, in the whole thing, a path is not in position space, but in box space. So you would expect that the quantum probability to return is given the leading order by the classical one. And only if you get to the same state back, you would have this enhancement, elastic enhancement factor. And this you can check now. Maybe I skip here the details. Now we have a ring of a five side ring. Um, so we have the um, Fox space dimension or river space dimensions about 10,000. We have certain interaction and um, disorder. We can include disorder to do the disorder average at the end. And then, well, we um, choose initial state here quantum mechanically and let it quantum mechanically evolve the initial state to some final state. And we may compute then, you know, we do CN squares that give the quantum probability to get from one certain initial to a final state. So you start to evolve, or I can jump, jump, jump here. So this is the example. I, look, we start from a chosen, randomly chosen state, three, two, three, four, two. This uh, distribution here. This is this state here. And then we compute the probability quantum mechanically and fully classically, uh, classical Monte Carlo, to get to any other state which are on shell and like a different combination. Now I flip this. So we had our initial state. This is the probability. Now the different panels are for different time steps. So initially, um, after one step in um, units of J on those hopping, oh, you see, so I should say classical are these red crosses here. And quantum average over disorder are these diamonds. At the beginning, both are up here because the time is too short that even classically to diffuse away. But then, if you go to longer and longer time scales, you see fully classically, it is just equilibrated, of course. This is the classical solution. But quantum mechanically, we get an enhancement here, effective two. And this is what we could just easily pred predict now with this many body propagator. We have just the effect of two because it is well. This was the data. What we had. Well, we go back. Now you can check whether this is indeed a kind of a quantum result. We used um, well. I should mention here. So this is in a way queer backscattering in Fox space. For a finite system, this is what you could argue. This inhibits quantum agonicity because if your system is finite, as our ring here, I will always stay here. So for long, long times. In the thermodynamic limit of a huge system, this gets smaller and smaller, relative corresponding, I mean, relative to rest. Anyhow, now here, just as an example, we have again the thing without a flux. And now I can switch in, in an atomic physics system, in a Bose Hubbard model system, you would have an artificial gauge field that you can indeed in experiments switch on. And then you see that is now, unfortunately, for us, uh, that's green. So here's the green uh, goes down because you get um, defacing due to this change of breaking of time reversal symmetry. So this is now time reversal symmetry breaking in Fox space. So this is relatively simple because we use semi classics as a starting point, but then we said we use just a diagonal approximation. So we will. Leave away all the different interference contributions you would have. Now we come to um, a more complicated system. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I would not know. I mean, I would guess so, but I think we didn't try. I would, I would not know why not, because it is ra really rather analogous. But I should be careful. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, please. Yeah, well, rather vaguely, because I mean, you can consider this coherent backscattering in condensed matter physics, and it's called of course related to what is called weak localization. So, weak localization is a precursor of strong localization. So, in this sense, you could argue qualitatively that this is a small precursor of many body localization, though the mechanism is really different. 
yeah, we did a disorder evolution. Yeah, so in this phase, I mean, this is kind of, you get a, yeah, you get a non, I mean, it's non ergodic uh, because it's beyond classical ergodicity. Yeah. Uh, let's put it like, yeah, let's put it more quantitatively. Here we need a bit of this order just to have an average, to average over different spectra or different um, propagators. In MBL, you need strong disorder, relatively strong disorder. And if you are in MBL, you know um, with each year that is proceeding, it needs more and more stronger and stronger disorder. So it's kind of a running constant. <laughs> Anyhow, but another issue. <laughs> so, okay. So, but this brings me here to this experiment now from, um, from the Griner lab, because this is a pre which looks like MBL. So here they start from a highly non-equilibrium state. Now where they have a few atoms here. So you see if they have a density wave, atoms nearly zero atoms and so on. In each second, well, they have atoms. So this is a highly, due to an interaction, excited many body state. And then they let their um, system evolve and measure as a function of time, um, mainly the degree of uh, the difference between adjacent um, minima here and if this is goes to zero, this would be the same situation here, then everything ergodically um, um, kind of is thermalized. While if they have strong interaction, at least at, on that time scales, they stay here. This would be an indicator of many body localization precisely due to the strong um, disorder. Now we are, I mean, I just mentioned this because we are interested in this regime where you have indeed equilibration and would like to use this now to check, I mean, not directly the experiment, it's more just in, uh, motivation, how our methods work. And so the, um, well, the system we consider is an autocorrelation function or also called survival probability. So you start with initial state like this one here, then you let it evolve quantum mechanically and semi-classically, and then you project on the initial state. So it's a kind of an echo. And again, we consider those, this at large n or relatively at large n. Now, a few uh, words um, on that. Um, I mentioned at the beginning, one can, there are different approaches to semi-classically compute the final propagators now. And here, this would be another rather um, powerful approach. And um, one call it, we call it semi-classical propagation, Alain Maslow, I'm not sure whether um, Steve would agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, it is mainly, I mean, that's now, there's a lot of um, knowledge behind this. Mainly you start with initial wave function, you know, a kind of a WKB looking wave function with e to the S zero. And then you let this evolve and compute along classical paths, Lagrangian manifolds, semi-classically um, then wave functions. You have to compute the trajectories, the actions, the momentum and all that. I need to be fast as you know. And now, if you start now with um, here, the initial state is a coherent state. Um, this is one, then this would have an exponent which relates to an action, which is not the most general form, but an action for a coherent state that you comp can compute in the QP representation. The main point I would like to make here, so it's kind of like a, is that this action here includes now imaginary and real parts. And if you include this here with the I, you see it's complex. So it's centered around the condensate wave function, say the wave function we saw just um, um, in the experiment. The Tibby's part is, but here, I mean, there are a few experts and I think Steve is really the world expert in that. Since the action is complex, also of course, um, P is for instance complex. That means you have to complexify your face and compute their declaration. And however, one can do that. And I will just show now an example where way more enters in on knowledge than I could show, just show on this transparency. This, but this is kind of what I think is state of the art. And that's really, um, I mean, Steve it should get all the credits for that. This is here now we compute for an example, bose Hubbard model, four sides, 20, 0, 20, 0, which are density. Now this 
a of t, uh, this um, return probability or survival probability uh, as a function of time. And you see, we start at zero, at first the state goes away, then you have the first kind of a classical hump. This is big. And then I let's first focus on truncated Wigner approximation. Then you see this dashed line that gets this peak, but then stays constant. Truncated Wigner approximation mainly means you start with a Korean state or say with a mini, with a just follow one path and its neighborhood. You would have a quantum state with a certain, um, well, zero point motion. So it has a certain extent. You use the Wigner transform of the state as a distribution of the part, uh, paths close to a guiding path that have, has to be included. This, however, is on the level of a mean field. Say, we're, in terms of our, as I showed earlier, this is mainly just one trajectory. There's no many body interference. This is fine and great until up to the Aronsworth time scale, which is roughly here. Then many body quantum interference enters. And then you see the upper part or the lower part is just. Um, quantum mechanical numerics just reflected at the horizontal line and the other is semi-classics by i mean solve using now um, the semi-classical approximation for the final propagator in the way i explained this and we see that goes even up to long long time scales it is rather quantitative we see deviations here you know what's the reason for that it has to do with the number of paths you include and so on but this, I think, a good proof where one can indeed show fine scales of many body quantum interference with these methods. Um, so it's um, one aspect to use them directly in this way, or this will be again the matter of the next um, lecture to use um, them as a starting point to do ergodic averages. Okay, and those are just details um, that show that. Now, I have, I think, three minutes for an So everybody can leave, but Steve should stay here. <laughs> I see, <laughs> he told me earlier he had to leave. <laughs> okay, so um, now let's step back and um, take a bit broader perspective. So I talked about already a bit in passing about thermalization, scrambling and all that, about thermalization. We are just an example of this um, uh, um, Bozabat system where things kind of thermalize and equilibrate. Um, so this happens, of course, in particular, if you have a, a fully ergodic system. And then, of course, there are now certain mechanisms in a typical many body systems that might prevent this full uh, thermalization. The uh, weakest one is maybe um, what is known as many body quantum scars you know, that are kind of still stable, relatively stable structures in ergodic space. And then we get to the other limit, which is MBL that was been, has been mentioned, where you have really kind of freezing of a well, still highly excited state. But if we stay for a moment with the ergodic dynamics, um, well, we saw that the Apolloff exponent plays a role, the Ehrenfest time is extremely short. So you have indeed, everything is classically unstable, giving rise to quantum scrambling. Now, the question is whether one can use, I mean, make the best out of Hamiltonian chaos, and I meant Hamiltonian is important here, and take it as a resource. And the idea here is um, to include, I mean, people always, and also we and I today, talk about unstable trajectories. So we have a the open of exponents, we have two nearby trajectories in orbits or mean fields that exponentially separate. In a, in a Hamiltonian system, you have also the reverse process. You have a symplectic phase space structure. You have also exponential, um, well, close, coming exponentially fast close to each other. So why not using this? And um, this we tried now as a precursor for extremely chaotic system, though a single particle system, kind of paradigm of quantum chaos, you, the quantum free rotor, we see it as just P and Q, rather simple, small phase space, but it is kicked and the kicks give rise to chaos. And this has been used in the context of dynamical localization in the 80s and is a, well, kind of one of the um, major system to be considered. And um, without discussing the details for large K, this is rather unstable and chaotic in the classical side. And this is seen here, if you start with one mechanical state here, 
it is after one iteration, after one click, and after three iteration, it is completely scrambled already. Now the idea is to now we go to phase space. So the initial state would be a Wigner transform of a Gaussian state. So you have just this blob here. Classically, you have now. Uh, um, so the idea is now to um, use this as what one might call quantum targeting to use chaos to bring your initial state here to a given target state somewhere else in phase space. And this is, I mean, we took ideas from classical targeting from the, from the 80s or well, going back to the 50s, I think. The early things are from 50s, I think. Anyhow, the idea is to use chaos to, I mean, that was purely classically. So you would say, if we are stay classical for a second, then you would exponentially go away here. But as I was mentioning, there's also the inverse process where you exponentially fast get to another point. This is um, kind of done by a so-called heteroclinic orbits that connect these points. So there is kind of a unknown to orbit to be that, that brings you um, for in a given time or extremely fast from here to here. The only thing is now we have to do with quantum waves here or quantum states, and we have of course version. So we have kind of the, here you, you see this uh, initially got, um, this like state gets elongated and there has now to use kind of um, unitary transformation to counteract it. From time to time, you have to kind of um, use this u to the m minus one, which, uh, which would say we kind of redo, we kind of contract again the wave packet from this longer sausage to again this while transporting it from here to here. And this is now the example. I mean, here, these, uh, these are, you, you see, this is one of these contraction that is used and you would do it several times. That's rather flexible. If you do it a few times here without discussing the details here, you see, uh, let's me go back, back here. So here we saw, if we do, don't do anything, then after three iteration looks like crap. If you now, the observable is here the wave function. I mean, there's a state and the, um, and here, however, you see, you can now keep it small and you will guide it. And thereby you can guide it to the target state. And finally, but that's better, I show directly the overlap, which is shown here again. So first starting, finding the, optimum hyperclinic orbit to bring it quickly to a target state and then in, in between compression. And you see here, now this is the overlap with the target of the guided with a target state. And you should read it in this direction. So H is again mainly H bar. So if you get more and more semi-classical in this direction, you get very quickly to nearly 100%. So the idea is, I mean, and um, I'm not aware of that this has been used earlier in the last 30 years of quantum chaos. So this is just an, one example which shows that this works in principle. But the main idea is to generalize this to quantum many body systems. For instance, so the Bose Hubbard model. So that an experimentalist also would give us or is interested in a certain time, maybe starts with a experimentally prepared state, would like to get this state, either do kind of quantum information type um, let's say operations, or would like to bring this to a target state that is not easily accessible experimentally. And the idea is to use this or other techniques to compute the optimal optimum control to do so. And Lucas um, has a poster on that tomorrow. Yeah. It need not, but it usually one would take Gaussian state. I mean, if it's too complicated, I mean, if it's of course a completely scrambled state already, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah, and one can, yeah, uh, yeah. Tor and um, I think it's four steps, three of uh, four, five, four, four steps. 
in units of the kicking. Well, but you see, you, I mean, we are now here with nearly, I mean, this stand, not necessarily. But yeah, but we, in between, we have this contraction, always, you know. I mean, you, you're right. Suppose we would take this age here, we would just get 98%. Then, of course, it uh, might be more difficult. But I mean, Rapidly converges. Yeah. Anyhow, so this is just one example of a targeting method. So Lucas, who's also in the audience in this poster, he will show already other ways to do targeting in a book product system and in these current screen controls. Okay, I think this brings me um, out of time, brings me maybe just to the summary. So we mainly discuss now these complementary limit, um, starting with the, the main thing is here we should not think about particle trajectories. Those are really modes that interfere and in are modes. We see this works either conceptually, if you use um, these propagator or density of states function now, the good um, um, trace function, go on to do again averaging in order to describe universal aspects as random matrix universality. Similar in concept as in mesoscopic physics. Um, that is one direction, but you see, we saw also what we were in the last example of the, um, the semi-classical calculation um, of the echo that you can indeed do this numerically also in a semi-classical way in a regime of large particle numbers. And you know, um, of course there's, um, no free lunch, but if you go to larger and larger particle number of system sites, quantum mechanics gets exceedingly more complicated. In the large n limit, at least, semi classics literally should get more precise. There are again limits, of course, to this method in finding paths and so. But um, in a way, the strength of semi classics is large n here because that is small h bar effective, where quantum mechanics gets different or difficult. Okay, so um, I finish with this, and on Thursday, I will make the link then to university. Thanks a lot. Are yeah, there further questions or comments? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, one can find, yeah, sure, but not, I mean, not for, not for any, I mean, it depends on the system. It depends on the phase space. I mean, two sides, yes. Four sides, six sides. In a way, here also. I think here, I mean, here the orbits were not periodic, but they are still, I mean, complex. So here about 150 or how many were over? Okay. Mm -hmm. It's complex. Mm -hmm. no. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
I think so, yes. I mean, one should have the, I mean, one should have a semi classical limit, yes. Yeah, but yeah, here it was made, I mean, that was, yeah. So this is just one representation. Yeah. I think it is. Yes. Yeah, I mean the concepts are the, are the same. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was here mainly for the Bose Hubble. Yeah. Okay, I think everybody's waiting for coffee. Or <laughs> thank you.